So here I am on the bus going to my work function. 99% of this video is going to be slideshow because I did not feel comfortable recording during a work session, but still wanted to get some content. Here I am in that Ford Rotunda building, being very fancy. Here are some of the ventilators that Ford made when they switched over during the pandemic. Here's the center of the rotunda. The car behind me is the lightning. Self-sustaining plant wall that I thought was cool. But really, 99% of this video is Fairlane, and that's where Henry and Clara Ford lived. Here is a view looking upwards, and here is a view of the library. Everything to the left of the fireplace is original books. And here's an original Anna Karenina, because I love my Tolstoy. The organ, which was in the front room. And the cool thing about this next photo is that lines up with the Equinox. Super fun. Absolutely lovely, just all around. So much restoration has gone into here. People like Thomas Edison sat at that table. This was Henry's man cave. Apparently he loved stew. This was the original bowling alley that they're working on restoring. And here was this secret tunnel down to the workstation. And I was mildly slash obsessively fascinated by this, as you can see by the photos. And here's a short video of it. vacuum cleaner system that was very fun and this sign which you'll need to pause to read the water wheel for the dam that they just built this was where they translated the currents one of two power generators that he built I just thought that was very fun and really I just enjoyed seeing all of how it worked how he set it up it's just gorgeous that's the transformer box and this was actually Henry Ford's garage. None of those vehicles belonged to him. But this was the plug for Clara's electric vehicle that was not a Ford. And here I am with the Mr. and the Mrs. in the bronze. The whole tour was just incredibly lovely. Next you're gonna see Henry Ford's pool, which incidentally became the place where they served us dinner. How cool, absolutely loved that. 10 out of 10, amazing. All right, so here's the courtyard that you can see from my room. That's my window right there. So what we're doing now is walking around Oh, plane. Plane. So we're walking through the Colonial Village, which is, hello, right out here. By 1935, the inn became so popular that additional guest rooms were necessary. Edsel Ford, in consultation with LG Treadway Company, were hard at work on a plan to add additional accommodations as the architectural plan of the inn would not, with good taste or economic soundness, allow an addition, it was decided to build separate cottages to accommodate travelers. In keeping with the traditional environment, these were constructed with exact replica of houses famous in American history, and inside afford the same comfort as was enjoyed by guests at the inn. This scheme was called, called for several houses to be grouped harmoniously as Colonial Village. Over the summer and fall of 1936, the five reproduction houses were completed at the rear of the inn. The houses were opened for guests in the spring of 1937. Interiors were full. Ooh, I'm gonna go this way. Interiors were filled with reproductions of 18th and 19th century furnishings, updated to the needs and comforts of the discriminating traveler of the 1930s. Promotional brochures boasted that the houses were outfitted with radios, telephones, and private bathrooms in each suite. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to open the map. Which house is which? 
I'm assuming it says on the house, and then I'll tell you a little history of each house. I don't know if these are still rentable. I hope so, because these are adorable. All right, so this first house is the Barbara Fritchie. Let's learn about Barbara Fritchie. Where are you? There you are. Barbara Fritchie, daughter of Catherine and Nicola Hauer, thrifty and respected Germans, was born at Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 1766. But her long and patriotic life was spent in Frederick, Maryland, where the family moved. She married in 1806 to John Casper Fritchie, a glove maker. Their home, a small cottage on West Patrick Street, of the type known as Story and a Half. Huh. With dormer windows. He could use a drain for his waste. He died in 1849. Barbara lived there with her only niece for the rest of her life. The house was destroyed partially in 1868. In 1875, the city authorities purchased the property, constructed a dam to curb the stream, and built a new home on what remained of the land. The present house and museum were built in 1927 and are in charge of one of Barbara Fritchie's direct descendants. The story of Barbara Fritchie, as told by Whittier in his famous poem, is not strictly accurate, but in spirit true and will be inspiring for years to come. She is buried in Mount, Mount Elevet Cemetery, very fittingly next to another great patriot, Francis Scott Key. I'm going to have to research what that poem is because I have no idea what they're talking about. So this house is also adorable, though needs some restoration work. <laughs> well, at least I know who this one is. This one's Walt Whitman. <laughs> If I have to explain who Walt Whitman is to you, then you've got some challenges. He's a poet. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Who's this one? This is Edgar Allan Poe! Oh, bet there was a bird on the lawn. How fitting. This is so cute. I want to rent the Edgar Allan Poe house. Oh, that's so cute. I mean, there's separate parking back here, so I feel like you can probably stay here. This one's really big. What would this one be? This is Patrick Henry, famed American patriot. What's their little write-up for Patrick Henry? He rose in popular esteem, especially after he denounced the British Stamp Act. He is the one who said, give me liberty or give me death. Give me a lovely house with an addition and columns. I love columns. Governor of Virginia five times. Um, the original Red Hill was destroyed by a fire in 1919. It is therefore our twofold pleasure in recreating this house from plans, records, and pictures that were authentic while inspiring true colonial charm for the guests of the Dearborn and Colonial Village. That makes me feel like you can stay here. I still lean towards the Edgar Allan Poe house, though, mainly because it looks a little like Green Gables. So this is really big for colonial times. Who's this one? Oh, it has a sunroom. This is Governor Oliver Walcott. I'm not going to pretend that I know who that is. Sorry, finding... Doot, 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 doot. He was representative of state legislature, member of the state senate, member of the Second Continental Congress, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, a general in the Revolutionary War, lieutenant governor, and then governor of Connecticut. The statue of King George III, which was unveiled in New York in 1770, torn down after the Declaration of Independence, was brought secretly to Governor Walcott's house, where the family and the neighbors melted it and made it into bullets for the army. Now that's what you do with statues of traitors. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, how fun. Their house at Litchfield reflects the fine living of the day. The original house had no wing or porch, so that's an addition. This was added in 1800 and destroyed about 1860 to 1875. 
Our reproduction shows this wing and porch taken from a print dated 1850. Oh, I've got to say the grounds of this hotel are really incredible and it's so cute. Oh, I feel like I want to go trick-or-treating at these houses and like be greeted by historical characters like Patrick Henry saying, give me candy or give me death. And Edgar Allan Poe just like, both the jack-o'-lantern nevermore. I love these little historical houses. I should have done more of this when I went to Greenfield, which I still don't know if it's Grenfell or Greenfield, and at this point I can't ask, because I went there. So that's the hotel in its entirety. Once again, looks a lot like my college dorm room. But it's a lot nicer inside. I wish my dorm room had been that nice. It's lovely though. It's hard to believe that I have to pack up and going home tonight. Well, tomorrow night. One more night where jet lag will make it so I wake up every few hours. I don't know why I got super jet lagged on this trip. Normally coming to the East Coast doesn't bug me like that. But I also don't have Phil, like, I don't have my inner, I need to wake up Phil clock. Sorry, Phil. But I mean, I've still been waking up early. Like I got up at 5.30 this morning. Tomorrow morning, we have to be downstairs and on the bus at 7.15. Which is about 45 minutes earlier than this morning. But we'll make it work. Had a lovely time at the Henry Ford Estate. Um, took a little bit of video in the tunnel. And then I took like a bunch of photos. It's weird to say that I ate dinner on Henry Ford's pool. No, they did fill in the pool. All right, well, I think I'm gonna go up to my room and start packing. It's been a lot, but it's been awesome. I've really enjoyed this trip. I feel much more connected to Ford as a whole.